Good morning, church. Great. I'm going to be reading from uh, John chapter 17, uh, verse 1 to 21. Sometimes it's called the high priestly prayer. This is the prayer the Lord Jesus Christ prayed before he was betrayed and arrested and crucified. John chapter 17, from verse 1 to 21. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might have give eternal life to all those who have, whom you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you have gave out have gave out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me. They have obeyed your words. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and the glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except except one doomed to destruction, so that scripture will be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may <coughs> have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you may take them out of the world, but that you may protect them from evil, from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that them too may truly be sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. There ends the reading of the Lord, of the word of God. Amen. Those are not my thoughts, those are the sounds of a jet. I want to ask you a series of questions this morning. Do you realize that you are breathing at the moment? How often do you think about it? I mean, we do live in a time of mindfulness, and sometimes you create a mindfulness moment, right, by focusing on your breathing, but I would like to submit to you that we don't often think about it. But the fact that we don't often think about it doesn't make it serious. It's actually very serious, because if you don't breathe, you'll die. It is so part of us, though, that it happens automatically. Isn't it fascinating? Even in our sleep. Because it is so life-giving, it is automated 
so that we don't neglect it. Can you guys imagine if you had on your to-do list, oh, just remember to take breaths every minute of every day. We wouldn't be able to keep up the pace. And that is why it is automated. Did you know that praying... is like breathing to the Christian and the church. Would someone close to you describe you as a prayer or someone who prays? Do you think someone visiting our church or someone visiting our city groups would describe us as a praying church? Okay, because the, it's the jet show now for the next half an hour. So I'm going to have a great time. And we actually did watch a part of the air show yesterday. It was absolutely phenomenal. So I want to have people have a good time. But if you can't hear me, just say, Dad, can't hear you. Okay. Unbelievable. Okay. I hold the conviction that we struggle, listen, with prayerlessness at the moment. Both individually and corporately. The reason why I say this is that we pray when we have an immediate need or crisis, and then when that urgency and then that urgency fades as things return to normal. That is a fact, not only with you as individual, but with us as a church. What would happen if we do that to our breathing? Just think about that for a second. Guys, now we have to breathe like we've never breathed before. And then once the urgency is gone then we forget about it. It doesn't make sense now, does it? Because breathing is equally important. It doesn't matter if you're busy running a marathon or sleeping. You can't stop doing it. It's always there. And you always have to do it. Prayer should permeate every part of our lives and our beings individually and corporately when we get together. Now, as we head towards our birthday, right, which would mean a time of looking back on the 12 months that passed, it's only in four weeks' time, and then looking forward, Lissachon, I felt that the Spirit placed this on our hearts, and that is why we'll be spending the next four weeks on this topic. So, our new series, it's called Breathe. Can I have the title slide, please, with a beautiful little handwritten font, because I think it's beautiful, and somebody made it for us. Thank you very much. So Breathe is the name of our new series. And in this series, we will study how and what Jesus prayed. We will hear Jesus pray for us, His followers, and we will hear clearly what the concerns and prayers of our King are for us and for the world. The scripture reading today was supposed to be the whole chapter to verse 26 actually, because that is the whole of the prayer. And through this whole series, we'll be asking the question, do we pray like this? Are our hearts aligned with the heart of Jesus? Would people call our church a praying church? And if they do, do we actually pray for these things that we will learn? So our scripture for today, uh, Rudolf, if I can have the black slide now, please, is uh, the whole chapter, but I'll be focusing on verses 1 to 5, and we'll walk through the chapter as the week goes on with the theme, Glorify the Son. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, when we open up your word, we know that it will cut to the deepest parts of who we are. We know that it is a living word. We know that it is good news. And we know that you have something in it for us today, for every single one of us. It doesn't matter where we are on the spectrum of faithfulness or joy or sorrow, or commitment, you will speak through us, oh, you will speak to us through this word. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give me clarity of thought, and I pray that your word would pierce our hearts, and I pray that we would not resist your work, but that we would listen to you, and that we would sit as kids, listening to their dad, helping them to love according to his will. Open up your word, Lord Jesus. We pray that in your name. Amen. So let me just give you a quick overview of John chapter 13 to 17, because we just jumped into John chapter 17 here. 
Here's a slide for you. It's taken from the Bible Project. You guys know that we love these posters because it helps us to understand where we are. I'll just get on stage now, and then I'll read five blocks with you. So, the whole chapter 13 to 17 of John is about Jesus' final words. There's one massive act in chapter 13, and that is Jesus washing his disciples' feet and then telling them in verse 34, Love one another as I have loved you, and you have now seen how I did it. It's not abstract, it's not woman fuzzy, it is sacrificial on my knees, touching your dirt. That's the way that I want you to love one another. And then the whole of chapter 14 to 17 is a speech of Jesus. We call it a farewell discourse. And then the whole chapter 17 is this long prayer that Mulanga just read for us. Now these five themes written in these five blocks bind together this whole unit. So if you read 14 to 17, you'll see these things pop up the whole time. And I want to show it to you before we get into verses 1 to 5. So Jesus going away and sending His Spirit is one huge theme. And the reason for that is Jesus could only be at one place at a time, but through His Spirit He could be at all places at all times. So that's a really important theme. The second theme is that the, uh, the God we serve is one God, and He consists of a loving relationship. That's who He is. And it's the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, we are brought into this relationship. It's awesome. We're going to get to that in verse 3. The third theme is being connected to Jesus, abiding in Him, in the same way that a branch would be connected to a vine. We can't live without Him. We can't bear fruit without Him. We need Him. Another theme in this whole block is the fact that the Spirit will empower the followers of Jesus to do something, like they've been called to do something. It's not about getting a ticket into eternity, it's about completing a mission. There's work to do here, but you find the power through the Spirit, not through your own means. And then the fifth theme is that the church will face opposition, and they will be hated as Jesus was hated. And then this beautiful reassurance, I'll get back to that in just a, a couple of minutes, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 33, don't be afraid, I have gained victory over the world. So that's the whole section, a quick intro. Okay, now about this prayer that we are reading today. It's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Gospels. So it is a very, very significant one. I've already said that it is a farewell discourse in which he says something, and then he prays for the future. We see this in other places in the Bible as well. Moses is a good example. In Deuteronomy 32 and 33, he says to the Israelites what they need to remember, and then he prays a prayer of blessing over them. Another thing that you need to note is the word Father is mentioned six times in this prayer. Okay? It's not a letter submitted to someone in government. It is a prayer to a dad. Okay? It's intimate. It's personal. It doesn't start with, to whom it may concern. It starts with, Father. And that's really important. Okay? Jesus prays as if they know each other. Very, very important. Now, what we'll hear Jesus praying for is what he's concerned about. And the question we should ask is, is this the stuff that we are concerned about? Because as Jesus prays for his followers, he gives them a vision for what they can expect. So that should be our vision as well. And through this series, we really pray that we will learn to do it like him. Another thing that we need to know about this prayer is this prayer is not uttered on a sick bed. Okay? It is at the close of the Last Supper. It's in prospect of the death that Jesus is going to die. And it is a victorious prayer. Okay? Jesus is full of confidence as He prays this prayer. We just read that on the slide in 1633. He says, I've won. So here we go. And that's really, really important for us to see. A good illustration, it is a sporting illustration, is when you have five minutes to go in a game, choose whatever game you want, and you have a huge lead. You know that the win is yours. You just have to close the game out, okay? Because you can't stop the game just because you have a huge lead. But it's clear to everyone, everyone on the field, and everyone in the stands, and everyone watching on the telly, that you are going to win this game. You cannot uh, um, 
lose your lead. Just a warning, there's going to be a lot of sporting illustrations in my sermon today, but, but I'm not sorry about it because they work really well. Okay, so go with me. If sports isn't your vibe, just listen to them as an illustration. Let me give you a simple outline for the whole chapter. Today is a long introduction, but it's because I'm kicking off the series. Here's a simple outline for the whole chapter. Verses 1 to 5, a prayer for the glory of the Son, that He may give life to those given to Him. This is our scripture for today. 6 to 19, where we'll be next week, is a prayer for the disciples. 20 to 23 is a prayer that all believers may be one. Oh, that's going to be a great sermon. And then closing out the series will be a prayer that believers may be perfected in the glory of Jesus. Okay, so the scripture reading for today was long, but from next week onwards it won't be that long. Let me give you a summary of verses 1 to 5. It is a prayer for the glory of the Son, that He may give life to those given to Him. It's on the slide, just so that you can also visually see it, because it's loaded words. And our sermon will have three points today. We will learn about praying to glorify the Son. That's verses 1 to 2. I just want to see that you guys see the same thing I do. Yes. We are going to learn about praying as an experience of eternal life. And we are going to learn about praying to faithfully finish the work given to us. That's verses 4 to 5. Okay. So here's verses 1 to 5 on one slide, bold and underline, added by me. The reason why I want to show that to you is all of these words matter in this portion of Scripture. There's a lot going on in these five verses. And if you read it slowly, and you park and camp out at each word, they will blow your mind. And you'll never be done with this chapter. Can I also say, if we did four weeks in John 17, that doesn't mean that we're never going to read John 17 again. Okay? We are just scratching the surface. I heard about a guy who preached 45 sermons from John 17, and then he wrote a 450-page book on John 17, and then he said, I'm still not done with John 17. Okay? Just saying. Just saying. There's a lot of depth here. But just, just look at it. Just look at it. Okay. So we're going to keep this up. As we go through these three points, look at verses 1 to 2. I said we're going to learn about praying to glorify the Son. The word glory is all about presence and it's about weight. In modern day vernac, it's about vibe. Okay? So my glory is all about my presence. It's all about my weight. It's about my presence being felt. It's about my vibe being stamped on a certain place or space or people group, right? I think I might have used this illustration before, but let me say it again. When I was younger, I was really into surfing, and my room was full of posters from a surfing magazine called Zigzag. That was my vibe, right? Billabong, Quicksilver, Instinct, Bad Boy Club, Rip Girl, like the whole vibe. So if you walked into my room, you would have felt the surf, you would have felt my vibe as a young surfer living in Gauteng, but having a really cool 5 foot 11 hooded villain surfboard that I used every time I went down to the coast. Like, that's my vibe. So if you come into my space, you'll feel my vibe. Glorifying the sun is about Jesus saying to God in verses 1 to 2, make people feel the weight of who I am. That's a really good translation for the meaning of glorify your son. Make people feel the weight of who I am. And then the rest of verse 1 and 2, make people feel the weight of who you are through me. That's what it's about. And that's the first thing that Jesus prays for, is that people would know the weight of who he is, and that people would know the weight of who God is by looking at him. Because God isn't far away and distant. He's here in Jesus, in this portion of Scripture. He's showed His compassion and love and mercy. So feel the weight of that character. Maybe a good illustration is the Springboks. Lifting the 2019 World Cup. I wish that I could have put a photo there of them lifting the championship yesterday, but I couldn't. So I just went back to the World Cup, right? Our most recent glory. That is a picture of glory. It is indisputable. It is a fact. 
The school board says so. Whether you like them or not, they are the world champions. The best rugby team in the world at that point in time. They won it 32-12. It is done. Your world champions. Feel the weight of that moment. That is a glorious moment, whether you like rugby or not. And I could stare at it for ages because I do like rugby. Verse 2 says, you said so, Father. You decided to send me. You gave me the work. And who I am and what I'm supposed to do is indisputable. Whether people want to argue with it or not. Now make people realize that. And make people feel that. That's the prayer. In exactly the same way that the scoreboard says the Springbox is the world champ, uh, the world champs, verse 2 says, You granted him authority over all people to give eternal life. We'll get to that in just a second. To those you have given him. A loving God. A giving God, a sacrificing, feet-washing, and obedient Son. This is who He is. Now pray that people would realize this, because this has got power. Who could resist a loving, gracious God? Think about it. Who could resist a Messiah that's willing to kneel and wash your feet like a slave? Who could resist a God that says, I'll give you everything you need, including eternal life? Who could resist that? That is a powerful prayer. And that's what Jesus prays for. I remember as a young athlete, so I did athletics, and, um, and uh, cross country in high school. And we were a mean cross country team. We always won, and that is a fact. And we knew that we were going to win, because we ran against the same opponents every year. And we obliterated them every single year. And somehow, with my potty cut... And my braces as a high school boy, when we would drive into a school with a school bus, we would go, on the sea, boys, on the sea. And then you would start eating seats and the roof and each other. There's a presence here. Like the team that's going to win, the Blau Tornado, Kloofies, has just arrived. You should feel the presence of us arriving. It's a simple illustration, okay? And I don't know why we do that, on the sea, but we did. Now, what Jesus is doing here now is going, because what's going to go down now is salvation. That's what's lying ahead. It is huge. He's going to give his life. The kingdom of God will come for the life of the world. And God is going to reveal himself in ultimate terms to show his redeeming love and power to people. Just think about that last week. That was Murundini's whole sermon. Is God loves you. And this is what Jesus is going to show us now by dying on the cross. So the glory of the Father and the Son, their weight and their presence, is expressed in the gift of eternal life upon humankind. In exactly the same way that you walked in my room and you saw surfing, in exactly the same way when you encounter God, what you'll see is love and redemption and salvation, and mercy. And Jesus says, this authority was given to him through his position by God the Father. And look at his authority. I underline the words all and all again. The redemption of Christ is universal. It's for everyone. The kingdom of God is as wide as the universe is. So the authority of the Son is, think back of the Vodacom ad, it's limitless. It's limitless, Jesus' authority. Do you pray for this? An honest question. I'm not trying to take you on a guilt trip. I'm asking you an honest question. Do you pray that the Son would be glorified? Do we pray that the Son would be glorified? Because this prayer is not a momentary prayer request. We will pray for this until Jesus comes back. Because there are people in this world who need to feel the weight of who He is. All the scoffers and naysayers and a whatever they want to call themselves need to feel the weight of Jesus Christ. 
the Son. They need to feel the weight of the Father, and we need to cry out in prayer that this would happen. Jesus was concerned about this. We should be too. Do you pray for this? Because if you do, you always have something to pray for. And you know someone who needs to feel the weight and the presence of a loving father and a sacrificing son. Second point. Oh my word, look at my time. Praying as an experience of eternal life. Now it's important to know about eternal life. You can look at verse 3. Is it's not about the quantity of life. It's not about days and years. It is about the quality of life. Okay, so eternal life, according to John, is not about how long it is. It is about the amount of life and the vitality that comes with it. Now look at verse 3. It says that this eternal life, of which the gospel speaks, consists in the knowledge of God and of Jesus the Son, the Christ, the Messiah, the King that He has sent. Listen. Eternal life is not adopting a new religion. It's not about adopting a code of ethics. It's about knowing a person. And that person is true. And he's the only one. And you can know him fully. There's no general God. There's one God. And we can know Him because He revealed Himself in Jesus Christ as a human being walking this earth. And He poured out His Spirit over people so that we can have His presence in, around, under, and over us every single day. This is great news. This is why we are a gospel-centered church. Because we believe that this is enough. And this is what eternal life is all about. Now, the knowledge spoken of here goes beyond the intellect to include relationship and communion. It is a way of being in a relationship where you are involved in it. Ask me if I know Pre President Cyril Ramaphosa. Then I'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you ask me, when was the last time I spoke to him? And then I'll go, no, 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 look. I don't know him in that way. I know of him. But I don't know him. I always used to ask teenagers, do you guys know Justin Bieber? Yeah, 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 yeah. When was the last time you guys had a braai? No, well, you know, I don't know him in that way. But then you don't know him. Because that's an intellectual knowledge. This is a relational knowledge. And it is about entering into the fellowship of the Father and the Son. Do you remember the map of John I showed you earlier? Father, Son, and Spirit. And we are invited into this beautiful fellowship. And it's about experiencing that life, which is the heart of life given to us. And it is now. Eternity now. That's oxymoron. But it's true. And that's what John says. Is eternal life consists in knowing God, being involved in a relationship with Him, going past head knowledge, to participate in intimacy with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you will live, and then you will live, and you live like that forever, from now onwards, and it will revitalize you. When I was a teenager, we had a confrontation with our dad, myself and my older brother, and my dad said to me, listen, I am not a ATM. And I said, Dad, I can see that. At the moment, you are a very angry adult. And he said to me, you can't always just come to me when you want money. And I realized in that day, oh, snap. There's more to a relationship with my dad than just asking him if I need stuff. Can I ask you a question? Imagine if that was true of a relationship you had, where someone only ever spoke to you when they wanted something. How would that relationship work out? It's exactly the same in our relationship with the Father. That's why question of the day led you towards unhurried, unhindered, and uninterrupted thoughts. When do you have that time with the Father? Because you should have that time with the Father. Because Jesus had that time with the Father. And He modeled it to us and we should do the same. 
Because if you have intimacy with the Father, you are living capital L life. Then you are living eternal life. A life that no one can take from you. A life that you can experience in this present moment. When Meryl sang this morning, I realized as we were singing that with God, there's always shade. With God, there's always fresh water. With God, there's always green pastures. With God, there's always calm and relaxation. In the midst of everything else that I'm experiencing, I saw a glorious picture this morning. I don't know if it was Eden, but it was beautiful. And it was so cool. And so calm. And so soft. That's our reality. Even though we live in this world, we live in. Once again, Jesus is the supreme example to us, but it also helps to have other flesh and blood examples. Do you have people that you look up to and go, the intimacy that they experience with God is worthy of following? I want that too. We should rub off on one another in that way. That's one of the ways in which we shape one another. That's why we had a ministry song this morning. That's why Meryl and I proposed that she take time and sing over us. Because where do we want to rush to? Think about this. If we are worshipping the creator of the world through song and prayer, why on earth do we want to do it quickly? We, would, we should want to be in that position. As much as we possibly can. I've already asked apologies for the sporting metaphors. Let me ask apologies now for using another kid metaphor. Guys, I love our kids. Let's be honest. When our kids wake up, the very first thing they do is they look for me. Period. They don't look for Marie. They look for me. Even though both of us are in the house. I want to see my dad first. They don't go to the bathroom. They don't chow something. They don't read. They run to me first. And then when I'm not in the house, if I went for a run, they go to Marie. Like, I need to see my parent first, because then I know everything's okay. Like, that's my very first need. I wrote this note on Wednesday, but it happened this morning, as I was sitting on our couch. I heard the door, <whistles> Ava came running up to me immediately. Oh, and let me share this with you, hashtag oversharing. I was in the bathroom when Katie woke up, but she's like, Wee! hello, Papa. I'm like, yeah, cheers. Really appreciate that. Hello, book. <laughs> you mind giving me some time here? But that's how they roll. They want to be with their parents immediately. Now take an honest look at your day. How do you wake up? Wait, let me just say, much is said and written about how distracted we are. We know that. And much is said and written about how many things compete for our attention in a day. I remember back in the day, like 20, 2007, research showed that you have three and a half thousand assaults on your attention every single day. Okay? Someone wanting something from you, either an advertisement or whatever. Guys, Facebook wasn't even in South Africa then. Do you know what I mean? Like Instagram didn't even exist. No online shopping existed back in the day and it was already three and a half thousand times a day. Can you guys imagine what the world is like now? Now take an honest look at your day. How do you wake up? How do you eat lunch? How do you drive? How do you go to bed? When and how do you pray? I think it is an honest and important reflection question in the context of this prayer. Take an honest look at when we are together as a church, not only for a Sunday, but also for other gatherings. Oftentimes, this is something that Meryl and I spoke about this week, oftentimes we talk about prayer. We even talk about praying. But we want to make sure that everyone is comfy, and we want to make sure that everyone kind of knows what to expect, where, in fact, it should be like breathing. And it should come naturally. Like, if I breathe and you breathe, then none of us have to think about it. Let's just breathe together. And it should be the same with prayer. If we say, whenever we are together, let's pray, it should come really naturally. And if it doesn't, why not? If this is what Jesus was concerned about and prayed about, we should be concerned about this and we should pray about this. Jesus weaves this little teaching into his prayer so that his disciples could hear it back in the day and so that we can also hear that today. Did you guys see that? 
Like Jesus was praying, a little teaching, back to praying. Verse 4, last point, 4 and 5. Praying to faithfully finish the work given to us. This is a theme in John, is that Jesus is on a mission. We see the words work in John. We see plural, works in John. We see that Jesus says, I only do what the Father sent me to do. I teach what the Father sent me to teach. I will accomplish what the Father sent me to accomplish. And now Jesus says, I'm done. This is it. I did what you asked me. Game is in the pocket. I'm going to close it out, and I'm going to get back to glory with you. Another sporting illustration. World Cup final, 2019. Cheslin Colby. Zip, zip, around Owen Farrell. Scores a try on 74 minutes. And when Cheslin dotted down the pole, just behind the whitewash, going out rugby jargon here, all of us knew that the cup was in the pocket. There's only six minutes to go. Pauly will line up for the conversion kick on 75. There's no way that England will make 20 points in five minutes. It's impossible. This is where Jesus is now. The game's almost over, and I'm going to win. Like, you can see it on the scoreboard. I've got one thing left to do, and that's to die. So in verse 19... Uh, chapter 19, verse 30, we see that the last work of Jesus has been completed and is yielding his life to God in death. And Jesus prays in verse 4 and 5, as he is committed to the cross, that the Father would respond to him and that the Father would bring him back to his side. Isn't that just beautiful? It's a prayer for glory. And in this prayer for glory, look at verse 5. He prays for the restoration, look at that, the presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Okay, So Jesus definitely gave something away. And what was that? Well, that was the glory and presence he had with the Father. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And He gave it all up to come and do the work the Father sent Him to do. And He played and He won. And now He wants that glory back as He's closing out the game. Isn't that just beautiful? This is what He prays for. To faithfully finish the work given to us. In verse, in verse 24... Of the same chapter, Jesus prays, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. This is the glory Jesus is talking about. Is once I'm done, can I be back with you please? And will you delight in me again as you did before I came? Because that's what I want and that's everything I gave away. It's beautiful, no, isn't it? Last sporting illustration. This is also a photo of the Springboks, World Champions 2019, but this is a different kind of photo. This is a photo of what is called a trophy tour, okay, in which this weighty group of players, and you can actually say weighty when it comes to rugby players, my word, I saw them again last night, giants, where this weighty group of players, who's already received the glory, who's already received the cup, is honored and glorified by everyone around them. Okay, that's what a trophy tour is all about. So they won on the day. They knew they were going to win after Chesy scored. They won when the final whistle blew. They got their trophies and their medals. They celebrated. They came back home. They all showered and washed. They got on their track suits and they were glorified again. But this time they look different. There's no sweat pouring off of their brows. There's no blood on their faces. Sometimes they do have blood. There's no tape around their legs and arms. There's no dirt on their faces and their shirts. They're all cleaned up. And they're being paraded around. Why? Because you earned it. You are the champions. You don't have to work for it anymore. The work is done. This is what Jesus prays for. He prays that he would faithfully finish the work that is given to him so that he can be welcomed like this again, back with his dad, all cleaned up, 
no more work that needs to be done. Oh, my word. If Jesus was concerned about this and he prayed for this, we should be too. This is where we are headed, each and every one of us. There will come a time where we are done working. There will come a time where there's no more blood, sweat, tears, and tape. There will be a time where we will be all cleaned up, where we will have the glory as the Father's children, and where we will be with Him forever. Jesus prayed that God would keep Him faithful as He finished this job, as He was closing out this game. Are we praying that? For us, individually, and for us corporately. Because we need to. We have work. Our king is one. Everyone knows that. It's written in the history books. He defeated death. He opened up the doors to eternity. Now it's about us. Keeping to the game. Doing what we should do. And being faithful right to the end. Look, I think it can be epic to be on a trophy bus. Let's be honest. But what I think is more epic is God the Father himself welcoming me the day that I'm with him, whether it is after physical death or his return, saying, Reino, Boitke! Well played, son. Well played. You did it. You won. You did what I asked you to do. Come here. Oh, that embrace is going to be sweet. Let's be honest. Amen.